Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, October 24th, 2013. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, another conversation about going pro, but this time it's going pro as the owner of a local homebrew shop. Desiree Nod of High Gravity in Tulsa talks about how she and her husband Dave started their successful homebrew shop, shares some advice for those who may want to follow their example. If you're new to homebrewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. You can find me on Twitter. I am Basic Brewing, all one word. Also, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. We have a Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video page on Facebook as well, facebook.com slash basicbrewing. We're on Google Plus, too. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our BasicBrewing.com site. You know how that works. Whenever you think of Amazon.com, think of us first. Go to BasicBrewing.com, click on the Amazon ad on the side of the page. That will take you to Amazon. You can shop just as you always do. It won't cost you any extra, but you'll be helping us to support this show. You'll be supporting to help us. Win. You'll be helping us out. We have... A- we have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Home Brewers Association on our site, too. Our Basic Brewing iPhone app is on iTunes, and our Android app is on Amazon.com. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory, and we're on the Stitcher app as well, and we're on the Windows phone directory, too. Check out our Basic Brewing Brewers logbook at BasicBrewingShop.com. In the front is a blank calendar that you can use to track your fermentations and plan your brews. There's room in the back to log the details of up to 50 batches of beer. If you want to put a tip in the tip jar, some coinage in our guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support. Thanks greatly to everybody who has done so already. Protect your precious beer with one of our growler bags. Check those out at basicbrewingshop.com. Now a word from our sponsor. You know that Basic Brewing Radio is one great way to stay in touch. With all things home brewing, another great way to learn more about brewing beer? Joining the American Home Brewers Association. More than 37,000 members rely on the AHA for great benefits like events, web resources, Zymergy Magazine, and money saving AHA member deals. As a non for profit organization, the AHA relies on members to support their work to promote, protect, and grow the home brewing hobby. Whether you're an expert home brewer, or just getting started, visit homebrewersassociation.org to join today, just like Steve and me. And speaking of the AHA, the AHA is celebrating Learn to Homebrew Day coming up November 2nd. That is an excellent opportunity uh, to get your friends into the hobby. Um, Look for local events in your area with homebrew clubs and homebrew shops, or if there's nothing going on in your area, you can work something up yourself. Find some ideas at homebrewersassociation.org as well. Let's take a quick look into the mailbag. Music. Fancy, eh? Uh, (laughs) Thought I'd have a little fun this week. Listener Andy writes in, uh, and don't know where Andy's from. Andy, uh, be sure to to put, put where you're from when you write in. Andy says, I know I'm a bit late now, but I did take your new Albion Challenge as my first all grain brew. I used the uh, Bruna bag method with your recipe. First, I have to say that it came out awesome. But the one thing that is different from the original is the color. Mine is as dark as an English brown ale. I only have two row in it. I thought it would be a lighter color like the original. Oh, well, it tastes great. But I was wondering if you have any ideas why two row would or could turn out dark. Well... Wurt does darken over the boil time, but it, but I wouldn't expect a wort with just two row in it to darken that much. Um, I shared Andy's note with Steve Wilkes when I replied, and, and he and I suspected the same culprit. Here's, here's what Steve said. Steve said, I bet there was some specialty grain in your grain bill that you didn't mean to be there. Perhaps a bit of chocolate malt, for example, that was left in the grain mill from someone else when your grain was milled. It would only take uh, about a half an ounce to cause a significant color shift. That's uh, that's kind of what I suspected. And then Andy replied, I think you're exactly right, Steve. I stopped by my homebrew shop on the way home today and got a quick look at the grain mill. 
Uh, after James's email, I too suspected that was the root of the rogue grain, and it seems that it was. Their mill gets plenty of use, and I definitely saw leftovers in there. So with that question seemingly answered, now I need to find out what grain that was in my new Albion batch because it was delicious. <laughs> so it sounds like a happy accident, uh, but a lesson to make sure the grain mill is clean, uh, especially if you're brewing a single malt beer or a beer style that is very light in color. And a lot of times the uh, homebrew shop will have like a vacuum cleaner nearby that you can uh, kind of clean up the grain mill before you you get your grains in there. So either a either a, a little broom or, or a little brush or, or the uh, little vacuum cleaner should help out a lot. Uh, the subject of this week's show also came out of the mailbag. Lee from Hawaii wrote in, saying, I really enjoyed the show this week on the subject of growing pro. I have to admit that uh, I've been one of those guys looking at the idea myself, but ultimately have decided that I don't think it's the route for me. I have, however, been thinking about going pro in a different way, and I thought it might make an interesting discussion on your show. I'm referring to opening to, yeah, I'm referring to opening a local homebrew store. I know that in some respects, the idea of a local homebrew store is fading away because of the awesome online retailers, but here in Hawaii, I think there's a real market for a quality service-oriented store, and I think this is true for many of your listening audience as well. I've been toying with the idea of opening a store of my own and looking for resources and naturally turn to the web and basic brewing, as I have for most of my brewing knowledge, but uh, haven't been able to brew, but haven't been able to find much for resources. I think I need to get my prescription changed on my glasses. I think a show in the business of local homebrew shop with knowledgeable guests able to discuss the pros and cons would be a great addition to the schedule. So there you go. Thanks to you, Lee. I uh, hopped in the car and made the short trip to Tulsa, Oklahoma to visit with Desiree and Dave Knott of High Gravity. Well, Desiree, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hey, good to be back. Man, your, your big new store. Tell us about the big the, the the. It's been a while since I've been over here, and you've 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 grown. We have grown. Uh, when we first opened our store, we were a thousand square feet. Then about two years later, we kind of pushed over into a company that moved out and went to twenty eight hundred square feet. And a little over a year and a half ago, we moved to seventy six hundred square feet. So we're happy. <laughs> You can turn around in the aisles. We can, and customers actually, <laughs> you get more than three customers, and they you don't feel a need to like get them out of there, and they don't feel like a need to get out of there <laughs> because there's room to to walk. <laughs> well, let's start. Let's go back and start at the beginning. I mean, the reason that um, the reason I'm over here, number one, I haven't been over here in a long time, so I wanted this is an excuse to come see y'all because uh, I, I hadn't seen the new store yet, but. Uh, I got an email a while back from somebody in Hawaii right, right. who said, um, y you talk about going pro all the time as far as um, uh, founding a, a brewery, but you never talk about going pro as far as fi founding a homebrew shop. And he was talking about, uh, he was looking into to, uh, starting a homebrew shop over there because uh, he wasn't real happy with the the one that was local to him, and shipping costs are incredibly high going to uh, Hawaii. Yes. Uh, so you were kind enough to uh, to respond with a real good uh, response. So let's let's talk about going pro as and f and founding a uh, starting a homebrew shop. Okay. How, tell tell your story first. Well, um, our story, Dave was already a home brewer. I met him because he, and I married him because he was a home brewer. <laughs> and uh, we were in the corporate world. Our uh, things changed rapidly in the corporate IT world, and we got outsourced to a very large company. Um, we did not like the prospects. And so jokingly, we said, hey, there's no real good homebrew store in Tulsa. We should just open one. And it started out as a joke, and then we started thinking, well, why, why couldn't we do this? We can take our bird with us to work. And <laughs> so we started looking into it and, you know, what's the markup, what's the margin, what's that kind of thing, and um, how many people does it take to support a local homebrew store and if Tulsa would be a good location for that. And nine months later, we opened a store. Wow. 
So you, you birthed a homebrew store in nine yes, months. Yes, we did. Nine <laughs> months. Hey, that's like, yeah, awesome. It felt like we gave birth. <laughs> <laughs> so what 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 were what were the numbers that you looked at, and how did you crunch them? I mean, how do you figure out if you're? I mean, if you're in an area somewhere in the world, mm -hmm. uh, and you think that that your area needs a homebrew shop, how do you figure that out? Well, you know, it was really difficult to find information. There's not a lot of business plans out there. On a, There's like about 50,000 on a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. But opening up a homebrew store, not a lot of information out there. We called LD Carlson, which is one of the main uh, homebrew uh, wholesalers to homebrew stores. Uh, they were kind enough to send us their pricing, mm -hmm. the wholesale pricing, so that we had a clue. They informed us of what you know the markup is, which is about 50%. 50% markup is pretty standard in most retail industries. And the other thing that we were able to glean from LD Carlson was that you need to have a population of about 250,000 people wow. to support a homebrew store. But that's all it said. You know, I mean, two hundred fifty is that is that a homebrew store that's open five days a week and you never have employees? Is that you just mm -hmm. there's just there just isn't a lot of information out there. And um I would say that two hundred and fifty thousand is not enough. I really? think you need a higher um if you would like to have some freedom and you would like to take vacations and you would like to have employees, I think you should you should probably double that. Mm. Now, does the internet change that number at all? Well, you know, when we first decided to open the store and we called LD Carlson, they said, um, do not count on the internet to help you make a living. As a matter of fact, they will not sell to you if you are do not have a storefront. Hmm. You must have a storefront because they believe support is in incredibly important so they're not going to sell to you if you're an eBay shop online or they're not going to sell to you if you're even if you feel like you are a homebrew expert and you mm. just want to do an online store they will not sell to you you have to have a storefront mm. and they told us that we would fail if we were, were going to count on any internet business to, to get our wow. company off the ground um, Dave and I are lucky we are in the IT industry very familiar with servers and and web design and things like that so we were able to do a lot of stuff that a lot of people would quite possibly have to pay somebody which takes away from their initial profits when you're trying to start a store so we were lucky that we were able to do a lot of this stuff ourselves so so we have a we have a pretty good online presence but um i think there was just some some luck involved there <laughs> honestly well uh, skill too I mean. well yeah yeah <laughs> okay, okay, I'll take that skill. Yeah. So the I mean that right there, I mean those are some pretty sobering numbers. Mm -hmm. Um how much I mean I don't I don't want to ask you specific information about your store that you're not willing to share. I don't want to, you know, just share what you're willing to share, but sure. uh what's the balance I mean between foot traffic and and online? Well, when we opened the store, it was by far store, in the store traffic. I would say for the longest time, it was 70% in the store, 30% online. Now I would say it's, it's starting to reach the 50-50 mark hmm. as far as online uh, sales versus in-store sales. Uh, uh, several factors uh, over different years, um, weather, shockingly, plays a huge part. Like super hot last year, if it wasn't for online uh, don't know how we would have moved to our new location, wow. you know, because there's other places in the country in the world that it was still located okay to brew beer, but it was 120 degrees here, so the, the in-store traffic just died. But uh, it's, I'd say, 55 percent in the store hmm. now, and and uh, the rest is online. Wow, well, that's a pretty healthy, healthy mix. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and and I make jokes. We're right in the middle of the Bible Belt, so it's hmm. a good idea. <laughs> to rely on, you know, and our local population as well, though, it's about a million. Mm. So we have a good population base in Tulsa when you can consider the surrounding area, mm -hmm. which helps. I don't think it could support a second store, though. How did you, is, is the product mix or is the way that you market to people, especially here locally, 
is it different from how you started? Have you learned some things along the way that uh, that you didn't know at first? Well, you know, you know what I would say is if you want to open up a a, a, a store. I think it's very important to get the support of the local people. If you want to have an internet presence, I think that's great. You know, um, there's there's more, there's enough to go around for everybody. But uh, having a local presence and a local support group, people that love you, that will that talk about you, um, is very it, it's very important. Um, so what I what I learned initially was. Focus on the local first, and kind of let the, which, which we learned after a few months. Quit worrying so much about the internet, you know. Just <laughs> just start focus on getting people through the door so they know you exist, because word of mouth is an amazing thing. Uh, so, uh, it's very important to to budget some of your money for advertising. I think that people it freaks them out if they think about spending money on advertising because it's so hard to judge the return on investment it is so hard to know if that because they come in those say how did you hear about and they'll go tv and you're like well we've never had a tv commercial so i'm not quite sure how that happened you know <laughs> so so you know so it's really hard to gauge how they found out about you but if you don't do it it's going to take so much longer to build up a customer base so if you just throw some money out there at the beginning and it may feel like you're throwing too much money out there at the beginning, but you throw some money out there at the beginning to do some advertising locally so people know about you, and then back off on the advertising once you get established and, and the mm -hmm. word of mouth starts helping you out. Um, we, we did a lot of advertising the first two years, and now in Tulsa, Christmas and Father's Day. That's mm -hmm. it. You know, We pretty much don't do any local advertising anymore because we have you know 6,000 local customers that mm -hmm. Bring in their, they will literally bring in their friends and say, "Oh, we got it, we got it," and they will they will show the guys around and set them up without. Well, they're like our salespeople, <laughs> so having a local presence and making them feel important um, is the best thing that you can do to get yourself established and ensure success. When I was in radio, uh, the salespeople would always say that um, buying advertising or using advertising is kind of like priming a pump. You know, when you when you've got a deep well, you and you've got a, a hand pump for the water, you've got to pump that handle for a long time before you start to see that's results. That's a good analogy. That, that's a, that's a, that's actually a very good analogy. Um, I would say that we probably spent too much money the first year because we had a hard time saying no to these people walking through the door. Because <laughs> when you open up a store, everybody finds out about you. Like every advertiser on the planet just starts to walk through your door and hey have I got a deal for you so we probably spent uh, we weren't we weren't as restrained as we should have been but I still think that um, in the long run it was it was it was a very smart thing to do was to just get get the get the word out what was the smartest buy um, billboard I was very shocked about it um, we we hesitantly decided to do a billboard and the reason we did it was because this billboard every six weeks rotated to a different part of town and they were key locations so the key locations were very good mm -hmm. and if we hadn't done one of those like serendipity things where we, we did this billboard and instead of giving our exact address it said 71st to Memorial and it had our website and it had a phone number they the billboard went up three days before they were actually started billing us the day the billboard went up, the phone star called him. Exactly, where are you at Seventy First and Memorial? Be oh. And it was—I mean, there was an absolute direct correlation with that billboard going up. So I was quite surprised. But if you think about it, billboards—it all demographics are seeing it as long as they're driving that road to work every morning. Mm -hmm. And it takes—you know—it takes a month or so before people, a lot of times, even notice that it's there. So it's got to be up for a while. But if you listen to country music, you're going to see it. You listen to talk radio, you're going to see it. You listen to classic rock, you're going to see it. You listen to alternative music, you're going to see it. So all these, you're hitting a huge demographic. If they own a car, that means they probably have some money, <laughs> at least, <laughs> to have a car. And they're seeing your billboard. So I was quite shocked. I was quite shocked at how effective the billboard was. Now, recently, uh, in the past few years, we've been seeing you in places like on each glass mm -hmm. at the at the homebrew conference 
how do you how do you measure results from that? Oh gosh, we we don't. I I just uh, we we love the conference. We love going there. Our, our our first year, the number of classes required wasn't extreme, and and it's gotten to be extreme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's but, getting bigger, bigger. But we <laughs> but, but but we let we we love it. We I mean we love going to the event. So it's kind of one of those things where we're probably we might deep down feel like we're spending too much money on it. But at the same time, we like it so much we can't bring ourselves to admit that, so we'll just keep doing it. <laughs> well, it's it's kind of a bragging point, you know. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. And and um and quite honestly, I mean, if you look at the other um sponsors, they're big. More beer is big. Northern Brewer is big. Mm-hmm. Um and so we kind of feel like we're like the little fish that's kind of, kind of, <laughs> somewhat keeping up with the big guys, you know, by being the glass sponsor. So yeah, and you yeah. know that everybody and everybody takes the, that glass home every yeah. every and they're going to see it and they see it every year. They're going to look at it at least, you know, in the corner of their eyes. They're seeing mm-hmm. the level of pour that they're getting. They're going to see your logo. So. Yeah, yeah. So I, I I I love it, and I think I think it it's one of those things as you become more successful, you need to narrow the demographic you're advertising to. Because at first you want everybody to know about you, so you want to target people that may not even have the idea that homebrewing was a good idea. Mm-hmm. But then, once you start getting somewhat established, you start finding that that doesn't help you out so much anymore. So it's much better to start focusing on the people that are already interested and in, into homebrewing. If you can advertise a little bit more narrowly, um, You'll you'll start. I think you get a little bit better results because you're not spending money on people that just kind of glance at you, mm-hmm. and 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 walk on by. So, initial advertising is very broad. As you become more established, I think it's a good idea to start to to, to start narrowing. Like in Tulsa, we sponsor um, Wild Brew. We sponsor the first draft. They're all kind of fundraiser, very beer centric events that. Uh, are targeting people that are into craft beer. So craft beer people are going to be a little bit more interested in possibly making it themselves than people that aren't into craft beer. Mm-hmm. So, And you've got to be heavily involved with the homebrew community. I mean, the homebrew club. Yes. Yeah, we're very, very involved. I was president of Foam for four years. I was a newsletter editor for several years. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of the former president now, so I just... Mm-hmm. I'm like the deciding vote when there's a tie break. <laughs> but yeah, you're yeah very involved. I'm the Foam Cup organizer, a great group of people. They're very core, about 150 members in Tulsa. Um, uh, that, that, again, is very important. If there's a local homebrew mm-hmm. organization, it's very important to be involved with it and to support them because they are your biggest champions if you're if you if you're supporting them you're they're your biggest champions they will tell everybody about how how great you are but if you're if you're like we're doing foam cup and we really like for you to donate some things this year and you're like oh maybe you know mm-hmm. you know like, things are tight you know or whatever then uh they're they're not going to think so kindly of you and then you know Bad experience, they'll tell 20 people. Good experience, mm. they'll tell two. So. Yeah. 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 You hear that all the time. It is true. <laughs> um, let's talk about product mix. I mean, if you're starting off a homebrew store, do you want to start building your own equipment kits and or ingredient kits right away? Or do you want to rely on your wholesalers' uh setups or kits you know I think it depends on how big you can be out of the gate Dave and I were uh, we had a thousand square feet so we relied on LD Carlson's Brewer Best kits we relied on their and we still do rely on the pre configured starter equipment kits we still use uh, BSG handcrafts and LD Carlson's equipment starter kits for Mm -hmm. for the beer and the wine boxes are they look nice they're well presented and um, we still don't have the uh, the ability to kind of stamp that with our own mm-hmm. label. So we're we're getting to the point where we're going to start thinking about doing that. But we still do that, and we still carry the Brewers Best kits now. But after we were open, it was probably about a year. We started slowly introducing our own recipes. Um, so I, I think it depends on the size. If you're if you have the capital to start out big. Um, and you want to put that kind of investment into having your own kits. I, I don't see anything wrong with it. 
but initially most people that are starting out they're starting out small like we did they're starting out with a thousand square foot or so and it's it's already done the instructions are excellent they mm. they put good ingredients in there they're well made kits and so i just don't think there's anything wrong with them uh, that's what we pushed during christmas because they're very mm. wrappable they're in a nice box they're you're getting one of our kits you're getting a sack of grain and because you know <laughs> it's it doesn't look as nice when you're buying one of our kits so christmas time we kind of push the brewer's best kits because they're well packaged and easy to wrap and um is there a different in, difference in profit margin? Mean, can you can you make kits ch more cheaply than you can buy theirs? Or? You know, I have found that um, margin wise, uh, they're almost the same. Um, hmm. Margin wise, uh, we we mark them both up the same amount, and the costs are pretty close to the same. Hmm. So, um, yeah, really, not not much difference really huh. in, as far as the markup goes. Now I noticed you you do your kits differently from where I've seen them before. Mm -hmm. Where I saw some shelves with, and I recognized some of the names on mm -hmm. the kits. Oh, let, oh, wait a minute! And There's nothing in there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's up with that? They're just little bags. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's one of the things that happens when you haven't seen any other homebrew stores when you decide to open your own. <laughs> you sometimes people think, "Oh, how innovative!" You know, and other people are like, "Why the heck did you do it that way?" <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, we basically uh, we have an all grain version and a mini mash version and an extract version of all of our kits. So we just thought, well, hey, we'll just bag the hops and all the common stuff that goes with all three kits in the bag. And then when, when they come in and say, I want the, you know, Pippin's Foolish Pride, then we just, we grab the malt and the grains for the version that they want. And so it just, and it takes up less space. Yeah. It takes up a lot less space than stacking a bunch of boxes pre-done. And I will say 98% of the kits are extract versions. I mean, most people that are doing all grain have their own, they come in with their own recipes. They don't buy one that's pre-done for them, so... And so I noticed you've also got all of your extract in prepackaged, uh, you know, like three pounds of this, one pound of that, you know. So, mm -hmm. so are the kits built around those? Are they kind of modular where you can say, "Oh, I need one of these and one of those," and you know, so that you can kind Most of easily of build them? Most of our kits are based on the liquid malt. We sell it in bulk, and so I can adjust the amount of liquid malt that's needed to hit that target. So you're not having to, uh, you know do different size like like the brewer's best kits you'll have a you'll have a can of malt and maybe a one pound bag of this malt and a, a dried malt and so they, they have to combine them to get the right gravity for that style of beer but we just we just dispense the hmm. amount in bulk so and i noticed that you've got a fridge full of yeast mm -hmm. um and again that that may be a, one of your advantages of, of living in such a large area in that maybe a, if you're in a smaller area you're in a smaller shop it may be a gamble to buy certain strains of yeast because oh, they'll probably go bad it before is. it is it's it, a so gamble you, here too i mean hmm. it's a gamble here we uh, like i said because we do have a pretty solid online base as well but um you're throwing away yeast at the end of every month hmm. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, I mean, we've got the hang of things, so we're not necessarily throwing away a lot, but there's certain strains that don't sell very fast. Mm -hmm. And, but you got to have one or two because as soon as you're out of them, then someone orders them. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you're, 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 you're risking a loss on, on the yeast. You really are. And if you're a small shop, you probably just want to focus on one brand. Either get the Y yeast or the White Labs, whichever you think is best, uh, because that, a lot of them are the same strain. And, and you're going to, right? You're going to throw more away. So a Y yeast ten fifty six, same, same thing as, as California O O one. So. Right, right. So the but you can probably predict some seasonal shifts in the in the yeast mix, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, we've been open lo long enough, and Dave, he's the one who does most of the ordering. And yeah, you 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 develop over a few years, kind of figuring out. Okay, you know, winter's coming. Stock up on the lager yeast because this is when a lot of people will try the lagers because they'll just stick it in their garage while it's cold. So yeah, you lager yeast, very thin selection over the summer and then over the winter, you'll kind of build up on it a little bit and then thin it out again when summer comes around. And you know, and in summer, yeah, Belgian yeasts, 
stock up on the Belgian yeast because they can tolerate a warmer temperature, especially in Tulsa. And so people will do Belgian beers during July, mm -hmm. you know, if they can't control the temperatures very well. So, yeah, you definitely, it, it's all experience and just uh, trial and error mm -hmm. to, to figure all that stuff out. <laughs> Y'all have also... Uh, you've deviated or you've, you've added on from uh, a, you know, the core products of a traditional homebrew store. For instance, mm -hmm. you are now a winery. Right. Yeah. You know, we thought about it several years back and debated back and forth whether it was a good idea. And initially, when we, when we looked into it, it just all seemed so complicated. Uh, we'd been open for about four years and decided, uh, and then it started, it started making more sense. I mean, we want to sell more wine kits. And we have a lot of varietals that people aren't familiar with. And so we thought, hey, you know, they can buy a bottle. And if they like it, they can make 30 bottles. And plus, we can take our kits that are getting a little old. And rather than chopping the price on them and not making any money, we can make wine with it and then, <laughs> and then still sell it at a decent margin. So it's so, turned out very nicely. So the wine, so the wine that you're selling mm -hmm. with your high-gravity labels on it, mm -hmm. Uh, with the government warning in the mm -hmm. bottom, <laughs> that uh, those are from your kits. Your Just home, from the your kits that we kits. sell, the kits that we sell, and that, like kits are good for two years, and once they start getting close to a year old, we take them off the shelf, and then we also uh, make the popular ones that people like as well. That's a, that's it's a great idea. <laughs> Is anybody else doing that? I don't think so. I've not I've not seen it anywhere else. Uh, now, do you do you have to have a certain space to to make the wine, or can you make it at home and sell it in the shop? Or do, you know, what uh, you are the regulations? Have, you have to have a bonded area that is designated as the winemaking area. So when you send them blueprints and you say, "This is where I'm making the wine. This is where I'm selling the wine," and technically it can't be the exact same spot, uh -huh. but it can be ten feet away. Huh. You know, but every state has their own laws, so mm -hmm. that's the important thing too. Every state has their own laws, and Oklahoma has some very weird laws. <laughs> but for a winery, those are the easiest, most lenient laws. Is for a winery, you don't have to be at twenty one to go in. You can sell wine on Sunday. You, you know, so it it, it wasn't so cumbersome because if we if kids couldn't come into the store, we would have never done it because right. uh, that's you know we get calls every day. Uh, my my son's only eight. Can you come in with me? You know, so that was important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and you're you're a family shop. We're a family shop. Yeah, yeah. We're family owned. Half our family works for us, <laughs> <laughs> which is another advantage, maybe. Uh, Could be. Yeah, I, I think it's an advantage. They have a vested interest in making sure your store is successful mm -hmm. when you hire your your kids to help you. <laughs> if you have a good relationship with yeah. your kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that too. That too. And you, uh, you one another advantage of this bigger store is that uh, I'm assuming that what I saw out there was the education space, the kind of classroom space. Yeah, you know, even in the old space, we did a, a free workshop every two weeks. That's also another way to get new people. I mean, there's no obligation whatsoever. If you offer a workshop, don't make don't don't put any conditions on it. Mm -hmm. Don't charge for it. Don't do it. Consider it an advertising expense because they don't feel pressure and they feel like you're really there to show them how this is done and and uh, and they're more likely to get started. So mm -hmm. uh, we do a workshop every two weeks but one beer and then wine and then beer and then wine. And yeah, and this made for a much more comfortable demo area. It was really cramped. Mm -hmm. And I have a voice that just booms. <laughs> and so in the old store, in the old store, you know, uh, my husband was constantly waving his hands at me to lower my voice <laughs> because the customers couldn't hear what he was saying to them during my class. Because <laughs> uh, Dave is quite uh, soft-spoken. Yes, yes. Which is why he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah, and when he does his demo, I'm like, honey, I don't think that any of the students heard you. Because he does the beer and I do the wine. But that, but that, is, a, that is one way that you can take fear because a lot of, I mean, I've, I've helped Andy Sparks in his store, the, mm -hmm. home, the home brewery mm -hmm. in Fayetteville. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, the looky-loos who come in, they have no idea. They're looking around. They're seeing equipment. They're seeing ingredients. They have no vision, of, no way to see how it all comes together. So 
unless you have a fine DVD or a <laughs> <laughs> oh, which or, we sell by the way. Yes, Lots exactly, of them. exactly. Or a class uh, mm-hmm. that they can go to and actually see it being done. Mm-hmm. I mean, once you see it done, it's like, oh, exactly. I can do that. Well, exactly. You know, I'm a visual person too. I mean, I can I can read text over and over until mm-hmm. I've done it and I see it. It just doesn't necessarily all click in. Just like all grain, when I decided to do all grain, I kept reading the book and reading the book and reading the book, and I kept thinking, this is confusing. And then you finally do an all grain batch, and you're going, oh. Yeah, well, that's just steeping it's grain just at, steeping grain at a, certain a certain temperature, temperature yeah. for a certain amount of time. Oh, <laughs> yes. okay. Well, yeah. I can do that. <laughs> so it's the same thing. You take that fear factor out. Mm-hmm. It, and, and it, you know, it's all about you know uh, making yourself available to the community and making them feel like you're eager for them to mm-hmm. learn. That, that that's how you. If you want to own a homebrew shop, you have to be very excited about every customer that comes in, no matter what it is they want and it can be hard to do because and it can also be hard to remember they've never brewed before Mm -hmm. when you say fermentable they may not know what fermentable means you have to you know that's sugar you know i mean you have to constantly remind yourself that this person is just getting started and they are uber excited and you have to be right there excited with them because if you're not then they they kind of feel a little disappointed you know so you have to be ready to be excited every day and when people come in your store. Some, some people would need more hand-holding than others. Some need some, a lot some more. will come in and just say, show me where the kits are, how much does it cost? And they're off, Boom. yeah. Others, it takes time. Oh, yeah, and, and, and you'll get calls from them two or three times a day, is, mm-hmm. you know, because they're very concerned about stuff. And, <laughs> and, you, and you cannot, and, and you have to be eager. And I'm not saying act like it. You really have to be eager to help them. You have to understand that they're very excited about this hobby, and they have a, a clue mm-hmm. to what the process is. And you have to be willing to take the time out. Don't sound bored with them. Don't sound irritated that you're having to talk to them on the phone for the tenth time. You have to. So it, it has to. You have to be committed to to realizing that you're going to spend a lot of your time answering the exact same questions over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. And 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 you have to ask yourself. Am, am I going to be tired of this mm-hmm. quickly? I mean, how, how, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. If you're the type of person who loves to like kind of educate people on things, mm-hmm. you're a very good candidate for owning a homebrew store, especially if that's when your passionate hobby. But if um, if you're the type of person who rolls their eyes, you know, mm-hmm. after someone you know asks you a question the third time because they didn't quite get the first two times you answered them, <laughs> then. You may find that you are extremely irritated with this job yeah. <laughs> very quickly. So you, the, if there's a personality type issue, mm-hmm. I mean, involved in, in, as well. I mean, if you want to go pro and own a brewery, you're not PR and talking to people all day. You just get to go mm-hmm. brew beer, even though we all know that that's not all there is to that either. But it, it's a different type of person doing brewing at a brewery than a person who has to be up front with a lot of new brewers every day. And yeah. you, you have to ask yourself, is that something that I think I can do and that I would enjoy or would I just drive me crazy? You guys have also, um, in addition to starting the the winery, uh, which I can't get over how good, <laughs> how good an idea that is, um, you also are making your own electric brewing systems yes so you're actually becoming an equipment manufacturer as well we are um i guess dave did a report not too long ago and i think we've we've sold over a thousand of them now wow so it's kind of one of those you tell two friends and they tell two friends and they do Mm -hmm. tell and then four years later all of a sudden you can't keep up (laughs) so it's a good thing it's a very good thing but um it, it it's dave's baby he's he's so he he loves it because because he, he gets to kind of go back to his old um, electronics background mm. and you know it's not like computer IT stuff it's like true electronics and circuits mm. and building stuff and and um, uh, he came up with the first concept of it and to be honest I was like really we're gonna really are you sure <laughs> you know and uh, and it, it's become very popular we're, we actually have several of our systems in as pilot breweries and some some. Uh, commercial uh, brewing facilities. Wow. Marshall here in Tulsa has one of ours. O'Fallon uh, yeah. Brewery. Really? Uh, their test pilot system is, is one of ours. 
and there's some others I can't I can't think of right now. But there's several of them out there where they're using them as their as their pilot system. But that's another way that you, that y'all are kind of differentiating yourself uh, among all the other homebrew shops that are out there. You know, you could become the electronic or the electric brewery place that you know that that may be your, what you hang your hat on that's uh i think that would dave would be absolutely thrilled if that's what we were known for <laughs> <laughs> you know because it is it's a it's a very cool product it's a very energy efficient product it's a it's a the electric brewing systems that he's come up with and they're and they're they're very simplistic by design and when you see them you're like wow that's just why didn't i think of that why didn't i think of that yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah we, we love the, the brewing systems yeah, and, and uh, it, it's hard to find your niche, you know, mm-hmm. what makes us stand out from the others, especially if you're trying to, com- if you do want to try to compete online. It's, um, that makes it a little, it's, it's, it's a challenge, you know, because we're all selling basically the same stuff, mm-hmm. you know, and it boils down to how's the service, how, 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 re- how reliable is the accuracy of the orders, mm-hmm. and what does it cost for shipping? Mm-hmm. Those are your so, yeah, so to find something that is a little special and different, I think, is pretty cool. And I, the electric breweries kind of fit that bill. Well, very good. Is there, what have we missed? What glaring thing, what glaring obvious thing that I should have been asking all along have I missed asking? <laughs> well, you know, um, you, you want it when you're opening a business, you need to think about it. You need to think about it. We didn't just say, hey, let's open a homebrew store, and then a month later we had a homebrew store. It was, it was what it was nine months plus of looking at numbers and looking at locations and trying to figure out if this is something that was going to work in Tulsa. You know, uh, you you want your store to look like when your customer walks in, they're not going to be out of business in a week. Mm-hmm. So you need to have capital. You need to have a decent inventory. You can't, they can't walk in your store and have these sparse looking shelves and you tell them, oh, as we grow, there'll be more stuff on the shelf because they're going to think, oh, they're not going to grow, <laughs> you know? So, so that you need to, so when you're opening a business, you need to make sure that when you open the doors, you look like you're going to stay in business. Mm-hmm. It's very important. And, um, I mean, we get people that would come, they come in the store all the time. Hey, I think I might do something like this. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, it's not as easy as it looks. And they would, and then and they'll, they'll say, yeah, but you guys are doing great. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> doing great. <laughs> right now. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? So, you know, there's, the, there's this perception because you have all this inventory on the shelves that you're just doing awesome. But what they don't realize is that you had to buy all that inventory and you pay everybody else first before you get to pay yourself. And so so you, you need to have some upfront capital and you have to be, you have to realize you're not gonna make money at first. So you, you need to have a buffer there. And it just shocks me how many people open up a business with just enough to open and they don't think about the fact that it takes six, eight, month, a year to get a customer base that can actually get enough revenue coming in to, to pay the bills. So I think that's very important. Um, so you need to fund your fund yourself. Yes. As well as funding the shop. As funding as, as well as funding the shop. Planning not to make any money for right. an extended period of time. Again, priming the pump. Yeah, you need to you you need to have enough to keep yourself going. And this is my personal opinion for a year. You can't you can't just assume that you're going to open the doors, oh, build it, and they will come. It's mm-hmm. not like build a dreams. It's just not going to happen that way. I mean. It takes it takes a while. Uh, we still have people that come in the store and go, "Wow, I had no idea you guys were here. How long have you been open?" Mm-hmm. You know, it it takes a while uh, for all of that to work. And I see it every day. I, I can I can walk by by new companies now and go, "Well, what a shame!" You know, if they'd, <laughs> if they'd at least bought a sign instead of a banner for their mm-hmm. you know storefront, you know, they they would have looked like they were going to be here for a while. So I I, I think that's important. Um, but pretty darn important. Yeah. Um, well, if you go into a store and they've got, you know, one bag of Cheetos and one bag of Fritos and one bag of Funyuns. And <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I, I just think that I think it's very important to to look like you're not going out of business. <laughs> well, you're you're carrying it off. <laughs> <laughs> well, yay. <laughs> yeah. You're, lo- you're looking like you're going to be here for a while. So. Uh, yeah. We're, we're, we certainly uh we, we hope to give it to our daughter when uh, when we decide we want to retire. So There you go. 
Well, thanks. I appreciate the time. And th and thanks for lunch, by the way. Too. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be with you. Thanks, Desiree. Great. Thanks. Well, thanks again to Desiree. She and Dave are great, friendly, knowledgeable folks. If you, if you want to look at their handiwork online, check out highgravitybrew.com. I, I just can't get over that idea of opening the winery in the shop to show off the kits. I think that's a brilliant idea. And I'd be interested to know if anybody else out there is doing that. So if they are, drop me a line. And uh, as well, you can drop me a line if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy. You can write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Our basic brewing growler bags are available on our shop. Protect your precious homebrew and craft beers. You take it from place to place. Check out our support link where you can throw a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to our podcasts. And uh, be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. We've got combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. And you can check out our basic brewing shirts in the store, too. Our brewer's logbooks are also in the store. Keep track of up to 50 batches of beer. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We greatly appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are... Ball regular mouth pint jars with lids and bands, set of 12. And Dakota Products PG001 pumpkin gutter and carving tool. Thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget you can also join the American Home Brewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com. That's all until next time. Till then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dutz. And Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. So long.